Hi, welcome to True Creeps, where the stories are true and the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore to the possibly plausible paranormal, to horrifying history, to tense and terrible true crime, and everything else that goes bump in the night. We're your hosts, Amanda, and I'm Lindsay, and we want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about so many things, but our conversation is going to start with Devil's Road, and we're going to talk about why it is scary and creepy and the reputation that it has. And we're going to go down some intense rabbit holes. It's going to be a journey. We are going on a journey, but our journey has several stops. It is, this road is creepy. Why? Sometimes we have tangents and we just randomly talk about things. This time we research them. It's all related, but it is a journey. I'm so excited because so often we're like doing an episode and we're like, I wonder this thing. And for this one, I was like, I'm going to lean into it. We're going to go to places together. Yeah. We're going to figure this out. Yeah. And then we're going to tell you all about it. Yes. So Devil's Road was sent to us by one of our patrons, Gina, who had sent us a TikTok by Sarah Turo. And that began our journey of research and questions. Many rabbit holes. Many questions. <laughs> So let's start with the road itself. People call it Devil's Road, but it's actually Cosart Road. And it's just north of the Delaware border. And it's a couple of miles long. Now I'm kind of upset we didn't go when I was there. I mean, I didn't know about it. Well, when I go back, this Blair Witch, we have a whole roadmap. Yeah. People say it's generally just a creepy, spooky vibe. But it's got such a particularly scary vibe that M. Night Shyamalan filmed The Village in the field near the road. So I've seen that movie. That is kind of a weird area. When I watched that movie, I was aggressively mad. <laughs> but I also feel that way generally about his movies, with the exception of Signs. Uh, yeah. Like Signs, I loved. Ben will accumulate drink vessels around his computer desk. And I'm making weird little like She's like cups. doing a weird hand gesture. Yeah, <laughs> of, like, of him being surrounded by cups. But I will ask him if he is the little girl from Signs. And that's one of my favorite bits. Like, are you the little girl from Signs? Do you need to have water everywhere so that your uncle, who is a baseball player, can hit the glasses and kill the aliens who are water reverse? You know, what a fun time. But for that particular movie, I could see how this could lend itself to be a spooky area because in that movie, it's creepy. It's a good premise, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So most photos that I've seen are from late fall or winter. So the trees are barren and the skies are pretty gray, which obviously makes it spookier. It said that the trees lean away from the road. Okay. When you are looking at photos of this road, there is very clearly one side of these trees that has a lot more tree to it. Mm -hmm. And it's the one not directly on the road. And I am very fortunate that I have a massive and gorgeous tree in my front yard it's this like really pretty orangey red in the fall and it gives off what can only be described as a offensive amount of leaves it scares ben but i love it but this year it had grown so much that bge which is our power company here came and trimmed our tree for us so that it wasn't in the power lines and it looked very <laughs> bizarre <laughs> like it looked like there was more tree on one side than the other just like how these look and the first thing i saw when i looked at these photos i was like oh there's a power line right there of course they're like all trimmed back because this would affect the power lines and then one of the things that we kept seeing when we were doing research was that people kept being like but it's not the power lines which to me makes me think more that it's the power lines <laughs> <laughs> and because they're like, they weren't trimmed back because of the power lines, but I don't think that anyone would have told them if they were doing that, right? Like, it's not like when they were cutting my tree, they came and told me that they were cutting my tree. I didn't have an option to say no. They were like, we're going to cut your tree. And I was like, okay, great. I was hoping someone would come do this because I didn't want to have to deal with it. If it's on a road, they're not going to tell you. Right. Like if it's just like a row with woods next to it, they're likely not going to be like, we're putting out notices to everyone in the neighborhood that we're cutting a tree that's not on their property. Yeah, that's fair. And there's a lot of different places around the world where the trees do grow in like very strange ways. Yeah. In different directions. It can be caused by many things. So a few people think that the source of evil is a property where the structure was first a home for children with mental illness. And then the property was used for 
violent KKK activities, horrible, and then the property was sold to a satanic cult that performed satanic rituals on said property. Interesting. What a modge pod of urban legends. That is a history. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty wild history. Yeah. But most people think that the evilness of the road is due to a house that is off of the road. And that home is allegedly the home of the DuPont family. Before this episode, I thought, I was like, DuPont, a common name. I didn't know so much about them. Yeah. Which, I mean, I don't know much about anybody, you know, unless I have to. But I was like, huh, I didn't realize most of them are from like this one family. And I was like, huh, interesting. Yeah. This town was apparently like, fuck you to them. No clue why. Okay, so let's talk about some interesting, weird, creepy things that are surrounding this area. And one is the skull tree. And there are rumors that the DuPonts would bury children with birth defects caused by inbreeding in or near this tree, and that the roots grew into the shape of a skull. And then recently, the tree was cut down because there was a ton of graffiti, because a lot of people would go and, you know, tell the the rumors and make uh, their thoughts known. If I thought that a tree was a resting place for children. children the last thing i would do would be like i should probably like spray paint it that would not be my first thought second thought third thought no i'd be like well that's very sad someone should look into this is probably what i would think and that's a fair thought and i also don't think that my brain would say hmm this is vaguely skull shaped probably due to there being children buried here that's never where my mind goes i don't know why Maybe I'm just not that smart, you know? Interesting. So there are rumors that large, dark SUVs are seen around the area chasing people off the land who are trying to drive up and look at the home and that the cars don't have drivers. Okay, so one of the best things that I saw is that local teenagers who know that these like internet rumors are around, so they would park nearby and when they would see like out of state plates, they would follow people. (laughs) (laughs) But could you imagine being a local being like, we have nothing better to do. Let's scare some people who are believing weird urban legends. That's fair. That's fair. That sounds hilarious, but also very scary right? Yeah. Mystery cars. Also, I've heard that the self-driving cars are not quite ready. So like, I'm like, we do not need self-driving cars, guys. Not yet. Not yet. Oh man, I want one so bad. I mean, oh, I want one. I hate to drive. I want a nap on my way to everywhere. I don't want to drive anywhere. If I was incredibly wealthy after I did all my practical stuff, I would absolutely hire a driver. Oh yeah. Okay. But let's get back to Cosart Road. Cosart Road, yes. On Cosart Road, Locals report that visitors will burn upside down crosses near where the home is suspected to be. Again, like, why are you messing things up? Rude. It does make sense to me. They've also, like, taken down some of the street signs, too, because they're like, we are not going to make this as easy to Ugh. find because y'all are annoying. That's fair and kind of sad when you're trying to get somewhere and there's no fucking street signs because people are idiots. I think that they're still there. You know how sometimes before you come up with an intersection, it's like, next intersection, Cosart Road. That one's not there, but the one that's like, this is Cosart Road oh, is, okay. is there, from what I understand. Okay. It's sad, though, either way. But there's also lots of bizarre rumors around the internet that we've seen that include things like allegations of what's been dubbed satanic activity, which include things like mutilated animals, upside down crosses, devil worship, and someone saying that they could hear what they were calling rituals occurring inside the home. What does that even mean? I don't know. Do you just hear someone yelling? Do you hear chanting? Is it just music that you don't like? What is that? It's just weird music, yeah. (laughs) Someone just like rocking out on some drums? Like maybe there's some hippies with a drum circle. Let them live. Yeah, I don't know how I would describe a ritual if I had to describe it, you know, like happening next door. Yeah. So we talked about the road. And one of the things we, we talked about was the DuPont family and this alleged house that they have. We're going to get more into the house, which is also called the cult house because of all the stuff that supposedly happens there. But first, we're going to talk about the family that is supposed to have owned this house, and that's the DuPont family. So most experts stopped counting the descendants of Pierre Samuel DuPont in the 1970s because there were over 1,600 lineal descendants. Oh, my gosh. 
Pierre Samuel was an economist, publisher, and advisor to the last king of France before the French Revolution, and that was King Louis XVI. And people widely speculate that there is a lot of incest happening in this family. And when they talk about the rituals that are happening at this house, they often are like satanic, incestuous rituals. They really conflate the two, and they talk about that some of the evil that's happening in this house is in relation to children that are born from incestuous relationships. And one of the reasons that this kind of rumor has persisted is because Pierre Samuel has been quoted as saying, the marriages that I should prefer for our colony would be between the cousins. In that way, we should be sure of honesty of soul and purity of blood. Yikes. Not a great look. So... Pierre Samuel's son, Euther Irene, also known as EI, which is what I will call him, was a scientist who was working to improve the efficacy and mass production of gunpowder at a plant in France. And then when the DuPonts migrated to America in the 19th century, EI came as well. And once in America, EI opened his own gunpowder mill in Delaware. And that's where most of the wealth of the DuPonts are known for today grew from. Later, they would also be involved in the invention of Teflon and Kevlar. Kevlar like we use in bulletproof vests, which I find very fascinating that those who are doing work with gunpowder were also like, here's how you don't feel shots, you know? Yeah. So per the New York Times, good sense put an end to the 19th century DuPont practice of marriage between cousins, which is good. Yeah. So there were cousins who married each other. So that did happen, but it kind of trickled out. They are still incredibly wealthy today. As of 2016, the family's fortune was estimated to be about $14.3 million, and their family's fortune supports 3,500 members of the family. And so, again, we talk about the inbreeding that was suggested and, like, actually did happen. People attribute the sinister behavior of that alleged activity at the cult house to the inbreeding warping their minds. And so we all know that royalty was inbreeding for like many generations because they were like, we want to keep it in the family. We know that inbreeding is not good, right? We've all seen horror movies where there are people who their evil traits, behaviors are directly attributed to the fact that they were inbred. That's a common trope, I feel like, in horror movies. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you often hear that idea when it's somebody who's rich. It's never like the wealthy billionaire product of inbreeding that's doing evil things. That's true. And so I think that's kind of like an interesting facet of this. But so we looked up what are side effects of inbreeding in humans. And we did the briefest of dive into this. And we did find one study. And there are researchers in the UK who looked at data from the UK Biobank, which it has genetic data from about 500,000 people in the UK. They found that about 0.03% of people had parents who were first or second degree relatives. From there, they could determine that those who are a product of inbreeding had decreased cognitive function, lung function, and muscular function. In addition, they were shorter and more prone to disease generally. They also had a heightened risk of rare genetic disorders, but they didn't specify which ones. But that would make sense because, like, if your family has a history of disorder X and you are a product of two people who have a history of disease X, you would have a higher likelihood of it. Yeah. When looking at the DuPont family, things that readily come up in your searches is that there are a couple of notable assholes in the bunch. And so let's talk about them. Yeah. So the first one is John DuPont, who shot David Schultz, who was an Olympic gold medalist wrestler. There's also a movie based off of this murder, and it's called Foxcatcher. John had a multi-million dollar wrestling training camp, and it was one of the best in the world. The camp was run by David. David, from what we had seen was not just an amazing wrestler, but he was also a pretty good person. John's mental illness increased severely after his mother died. For example, he was telling people he could see Disney characters hiding on the property. That sounds terrifying, right? At one point, he thought that geese were using dark magic against him. So, um, geese using dark magic, that's a That's something I haven't heard of before. (laughs) Yeah, there is a laundry list of the very intense beliefs that he had. He was not doing well. No, he wasn't. So several people had said that David was really the only person who could handle John. And no one knows why John actually shot David. On January 26th of 1996, John brought his gun with him when he asked Patrick Godale, his security consultant, to take him to David's house. David greeted John saying, hi, boss, and waved. 
In response, John said, you got a problem with me? And shot David. David died instantly. Patrick then jumped from the vehicle to check on David and then grabbed his own gun to point at John. John took the vehicle and drove back to his home. So his wife called the police. And when they asked her, why did he do it? She said, quote, because he's insane. He locked himself in his mansion, and for two days, there was SWAT and about 70 law enforcement officers trying to get him out of his home. They ultimately turned off the heat, and he came out. John was then convicted, and in 2010, he died in prison at the age of 72. Wild. So the next person we're going to talk about is a DuPont, but his name is Robert Richard IV. He is the great-great-grandson of EI, who had the gunpowder plant. In 2007, his daughter was just five years old when she told her maternal grandmother, Donna, that her father had touched her. Donna told her daughter, Tracy, what Tracy's daughter had said, and Donna and Tracy called a doctor and a child abuse hotline. Richard was arrested, and it was in relation to allegations that he had been abusing his daughter since she was three. So sad. It's devastating. It's disgusting. Get fucked, right? Yeah. Yeah. During the sentencing portion of the proceedings, he told the judge, I feel horrible. There's no excuse for what I've done to her. Still not enough. The original counts were for two counts of second degree rape with a minimum of a 20 year prison sentence. In February of 2009, his plea deal was finalized. And so what he did plead guilty for was fourth degree rape. But that didn't carry a minimum prison sentence. But there could be up to 15 years of prison. That could be part of this. But again, it's a plea deal. So they already agreed to what the punishment would be. And so before I get to the outrageously minimal penalty that he had, I just want to note that the evidence that they had was based on his daughter's testimony. And that was testimony of, you know, a kid that's probably a little bit older now, but she was five at the time when she first reported it. And there's not a lot of success in cases where it's such a young victim recounting what happened. And it fucking sucks. And so rather than getting no penalty, they were like, we'll plead him down to fourth degree rape. And this way, there will be some penalties that will protect his daughter and other children. So this is the penalties that he had. So he had eight years of probation, a fine of $4,395. He was required to have treatment. He was registered on a sex offender registry. He couldn't have any contact with his daughter. And he also couldn't have any contact with anyone under 16 years old. Still not enough. I hate that. It's so not a fuck enough. And there was like no media coverage of this. It's widely believed that's one of the reasons why this plea deal went through. Tracy and Robert's divorce finalized during the proceedings. Fantastic for her, right? I did see one source that originally Tracy confronted Robert about this. He was like, I promise I'll never do it again. But I didn't see that in every source. So I don't know the veracity of that. Now, remember, so Robert has to go through treatment. In 2010, just one year after that plea agreement, the counselor who was working with him didn't think he was making enough progress. And he also believed that Robert wasn't sharing his full sexual history. And that's necessary for when they want treatment to be effective. Because we're going to talk about it in a second, but like they need to know everything so that they can actually hopefully rehabilitate that person. His counselor recommended a polygraph which was conducted, and the results of the polygraph also suggested that he may have also raped his infant son. That's absolutely disgusting. People are the fucking worst. Disgusting. Mm -mm. So we've also talked about polygraphs before as purely investigative tools slash evidence in criminal proceedings, but we haven't discussed them in terms of sex offender rehabilitation or monitoring. There are federal guidelines about administering polygraphs for sex offenders. So we looked at those for a broad understanding of how polygraphs are used in sex offender rehabilitation. And there's three different types of polygraph examinations. And the first one is sexual history disclosure. And it's used to investigate their involvement in unknown or unreported offenses, sexual compulsions, preoccupation, or deviant behaviors. If the offender also denies the case that they were convicted of, that also may be examined. And what's interesting is it seems like it's this first one that they were using with Robert. Like, that's the, the point at which they were mm -hmm. 
And then the second one is maintenance and monitoring. And it's used to verify if the offender is in compliance with both their supervision conditions and their treatment. So for example, they can't have contact with a person of a certain age. And so that's a way of verifying that they're not. It may be used to determine the likelihood of them reoffending as well, which is very interesting. Yeah, I was like, huh, with all of this, I was like, huh. Yeah. So they may ask questions about activities to examine if they've been doing things that may seem like victim selection, deviancy activities, or high-risk behaviors. So it's like, if you're doing this, then you're probably, you know, it's going to lead to something else. Yeah. So the third one is issue-specific, and this is used to follow up on unresolved deceptive maintenance and monitoring exams. I had never considered polygraphs in this way, that they would be used for this. Mm -mm. And this makes me feel a little bit better about what someone is doing about sex offenders. Yeah. Not a lot, but a little bit to know that someone's asking questions. There's a, there's like a, a broad idea of how this should be done. Right. It just, I think it depends on the person though, because they can be falsified. Yeah. I'm not saying this is a foolproof plan because you're right. They can fool them. But I like it better than just a probation officer's judgment, especially like I would imagine probation officers are like very overburdened with people. That's true. Yeah. So the probation officers will coordinate with polygraph examiners before the examination to design the questions based on conditions of supervision and concerns. So they'll be like, okay, here's what I'm thinking. And then they'll come together to create the exam. Yeah, that's interesting that it's tailored to that person. Yeah. Yeah. And what they've done mm -hmm. or what they could do again. Yeah. In some situations, the results may be used to increase supervision modify supervision plans, or generate a new investigation. However, they cannot be the sole reason that supervision is revoked, which I agree with wholeheartedly. And afterwards, the offender is interviewed after the polygraph examination to discuss the results or future treatment or supervision needs. So it's shared with them after. So we talked about polygraphs and sexual offenders because Robert's counselor had used that in their practice. During the 2010 polygraph, Robert said that whatever he had done to his young son, he wouldn't do again. Okay. Yeah. So let's fast forward two years inexplicably and Robert's counselor reached out to the court again because he was concerned that Robert had sexually abused his infant son. Law enforcement didn't charge him with anything, but they did conduct an investigation. Again, there wasn't a lot of media attention, and this didn't gain media attention until his wife Tracy sued him in 2014 for monetary damages. The claim was that he breached his duty of care for his young children, and she held a press conference. They settled after a few months, but there's not any coverage of what the settlement result was. All over the internet, there is a lot of headlines that say things like, rich man abuses children no prison time, right? Like it's very harsh on the sentencing and like what penalties he received. And I agree with it. He should have been in prison. I'm not often like lock him up and throw him away the key. But if you can do things to fucking babies and toddlers, oh, yeah. like get fucked. You're no use to the society. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't think there's re rehabilitating you because get fucked. I'm not a proponent of the death penalty. But here I'm like, maybe like you admitted to it. Like you did it. Yeah. I'm right behind you. Yeah, like, we're there. But so, not surprisingly, the world had a similar reaction. A lot of people wondered why the presiding judge, which is Judge Jan Juren, actually let this agreement go through. Because this is a shockingly low penalty for this type of crime. But they knew that they probably wouldn't win at trial. But Judge Jordan received so much scrutiny, and she even received, from what I understand, death threats, because people were really mad about this. But other lawyers from that time period and other, like, state official attorneys have even chimed in saying things like, it wasn't a strong case. So we thought it would be better for there to be some penalties than have a risk of him being fully acquitted, which it sucks but I do agree with it. Yeah, yeah, no. You know, like sometimes the fear of being acquitted gets horrible people out of so much and it's just so angry. I agree with you, but in this particular circumstance, he was legally barred from seeing his daughter or being near anybody who was under the age of 16. And I think that that was the least that our society could do for her. That's like the bare fucking minimum. Yeah, but I mean- a 16-year-old soul baby in my eyes, you know? I know. I mean, I agree with you. I agree with you. But I guess my thought is, like, he's a DuPont. 
And he was like, also a fiscally supported DuPont. His money and his like trust fund and stuff came from them. He did not have a job. He was unemployed. And so he had an excellent attorney that was paid for by his family. And imagine a world where Tracy divorces him, right? And he's acquitted. This doesn't happen. And then he goes for full custody of his kids. Ugh, it's gross. I mean, he could. And he probably, I mean, I don't know her financial situation. So like, what if he had better attorneys than her? And then he got custody of his kids. There is a world in which that can happen. I know it's a, a possibility. It's just shitty. I hate it too. Yeah, that that, that even, you know, is a, a fear. Yeah. So we have talked about Devil Road. One of the theories that it's evil is the cult house that was allegedly owned by the DuPonts. So now let's talk about the theories and the rumors around the cult house itself that both do and don't have to do with the DuPonts. Right. So the trees around the house allegedly contort in unnatural ways. Oh, spooky. There are also rumors that there were cult-like activities, which how earned its name, perhaps. I've seen a wide array of descriptions of this house and the descriptions are that it's white, that it's brick, that no one can find it, that it has a guardhouse, and that the windows of the home are shaped like upside down crosses. When I think about this series of urban legends, nothing gets me like those upside down cross windows because I just simply cannot imagine the building of it and how that would work and how that would be useful in a home. Even your most avant-garde, audacious Satanist would probably have a normal fucking window. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Trying to get window treatments for that is a headache. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even want to get them for my giant windows, let alone upside down cross windows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe you just, well, you wouldn't just let the sun shine in because, ugh, his no, sun. So we scoured the internet looking for where this could possibly be. And the only one that we saw was six miles from Cosart Road. So not exactly off of it. And it even had a name. It was Gibraltar Mansion. Fancy. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. I love like an old abandoned looking mansion though. Like it's very Grey Gardens-esque, honestly. <laughs> Grey Gardens. I'm actually looking it up to see if the dramatization was shot at this mansion because it looks so much like that. Nope. I guess they actually shot at the original one. I don't know. It just has that vibe to me. It does. It really does. I'm looking up Grey Gardens now and I'm like, oh yeah, it totally does. Yeah. I've watched that far too many times. <laughs> okay. So it's not in Pennsylvania, but it is on Pennsylvania Road in Delaware. I could see how that's confusing. Very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the places where you are, because you're not that far from Delaware. No. But like, she was making fun of me so much for me being so confused out there trying to say names and trying to navigate. I mean, that's anywhere though. I don't know how to say anything anywhere at any point either. So only so much teasing can be taken from me, honestly. <laughs> but a lot of things will be named similar things. And by the way, Coast Art Roads, it's right on the, the edge of Delaware and Pennsylvania. So I find it disrespectful that they would have a road named Pennsylvania Road immediately across the Pennsylvania line. It's just unnecessarily confusing. It is. But okay. So we have covered our first theory of why Coast Art Road is evil. And that is because there is a house with bad activities that's possibly related to the DuPont family. Eh, is it? I don't know. They're a little weird, though, you know? Yeah, yeah. So now, let's get into alternate theories of evil. <laughs> do you like that title? <laughs> the outline? <laughs> I do. I love that. So some locals suggest that it's not a satanic cult's house or the alleged incestuous relationships of a powerful family that makes the trees bend and the area feel so scary. But rather, they suggest that the ghosts of three young men who were buried right off of Cosart Road, and that's what makes the trees bend away from the road. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I do like ghosts. Yeah. Ghosts doing weird shit. And I do like facts because this actually happened versus like the <laughs> other part. It's just like internet conjecture stew of like random things and variables you can't give away the end we'll take it out no <laughs> i literally sounded like goofy when i just left <laughs> i don't know man i don't know I'm leaving all of that in so a lot of locals even say that the rumors of the cult house really gained momentum after these murders 
And before we talk about their murders, we need to talk about the Johnston gang. And they're one of the most notorious gangs in Pennsylvania. Hmm. The Johnston gang, led by Bruce Johnston Sr., was a burglary ring. Some of the members were Norman Johnston, David Johnston, Richard Mitchell, Leslie Dale, James Griffin, Gary Crouch, and Ansel E. Ham. They also had a group of teenagers that worked with them that they called the Kitty Gang, which is very a uh, non-threatening name, right? Cutesy, even, one might say. Yeah, yeah. So they mostly stole lawn tractors, which is a very uh, weird... It's very specific, isn't it? It's a very specific crime. Yeah, yeah. And some of those who were in the Kitty Gang were Bruce Johnston Jr., that we'll just call Jr. going forward, James or Jimmy Johnston, Dwayne Lincoln, James Sampson, and Wayne Sampson. And so we aren't going to get into all of their activities, but some of the things they did included robbing Dutch Wonderland and stealing about 33000 worth of cash and property. Today, that money would be about 244000 And I realize, Amanda, that you probably don't know what Dutch Wonderland is, but it's like a small amusement park that's in Lancaster. And it's in like an area where there's a lot of Amish people. So it's like the Dutch part of it. Why it's there. Interesting. This happened before I was alive. But I'm like, why would you rob Dutch Wonderland? It's a dick move. Yeah. One gang member, Ansel Ham, murdered two patrolmen at Kennett Square. In 1977, they transported $21,900 in stolen cigarettes. That's a lot of cigarettes. This prompted more questions for me because that is a lot of cigarettes. So in 1977, from what I can see, cigarettes were $5 a carton. So one cigarette was roughly two and a half cents. Doing that math, 21,000 by two and a half cents, that's 876,000 cigarettes, 200 cigarettes in a carton, that's 4,380 cartons. And that's just so many fucking cigarettes, you know? That's too many. Too many. Yeah. In 1977, they also stole $28,000 from Longwood Gardens. And in today's money, that would be $138,320. And Longwood Gardens is just like this like beautiful place where you can go to look at like all these different fucking plants and stuff. And it's just a treasure and a delight and a cool place to be. And it's like family friendly. So it's just like they're robbing places that are wholesome, which is just feels really weird. Yeah, it does. To me, like extra weird. Just maybe easy. So Junior was arrested in 1978 in connection with his gang activities and was incarcerated. Before he was arrested, he was dating a girl named Robin Miller, and she was just 15. Junior was 19 at the time. She wanted him to leave the gang before he was arrested. So Robin wrote him almost every day. In one of her letters, she told Junior that his father and James Sampson had raped her. Junior reached out to law enforcement to testify against his father and the rest of the gang. His testimony before the grand jury implicated them in various crimes, including interstate transportation of stolen vehicles. A subpoena was issued for Junior's half-brother, Jimmy Johnston, to have him testify before the grand jury. Bruce Sr., David Johnston, Richard Mitchell, and Norman Johnston heard that Junior had testified and that Jimmy had been subpoenaed. They realized that the rest of the Kitty Gang was likely to be subpoenaed to testify against them. The four of them decided that they would need to kill the Kitty Gang to keep them from testifying. Get fucked. Right. The evening before Jimmy was set to testify, which was August 15th of 1978, Bruce Sr. convinced Jimmy not to appear. He told him that he needed his help stealing a lawn tractor on the evening of August 16th and that he would send him to California until the whole thing blew over. He was then hidden until the evening of August 16th. Wayne Sampson and Dwayne Lincoln were also hidden until that evening, and they were told that they needed to help steal lawn tractors because they're obsessed with lawn tractors. It just seems so silly of a thing to steal. Like, I, I guess I could say that with cars, too, but it's just... No, I think it's it, it actually makes a lot of sense because lots of people could have a, a similar one, and I don't think that you have to, like, register them, so it's harder... For you to be like, that's my lawn tractor. You could be like, oh, I just bought a used lawn tractor. How would I know it's yours, you know? I'm more seeing this play out in my head because they're not the fastest of things. They aren't the fastest of things, but they are expensive. They are expensive. But like, think of the theft, like what it looked like and like keep a straight face. It just seems so ridiculous. So Richard and Norman drove to a secluded place off of Cosart Road and prepared a large grave. Wayne, Dwayne, 
and Jimmy were led to the grave one by one. When they approached the grave, they were shot and pushed into the grave. Bruce Sr. shot Jimmy first. Then David Johnston killed Dwayne Lincoln. Richard Mitchell killed Wayne Sampson. James Sampson, Wayne's brother, was later shot and killed when he refused to believe that his brother had been sent to California to wait for the accusations to blow over. Junior was subsequently released from prison, and Bruce Sr. offered him $12,000 to recant his testimony, but he also offered up to $15,000 for anyone who would murder Junior and Robin. Norman, David, Richard, and Dale agreed. They broke into Robin's home where Junior was staying. They shot Robin once, but they shot Junior nine times. He survived this, but she did not. So sad. Really sad. Dale, Mitchell, Griffin, and other gang members agreed to cooperate with police after they were arrested on gang-related charges. David and Norman Johnston were both convicted on four counts of first-degree murder. They each got four consecutive life sentences. Bruce Sr. was found guilty of all four murders, plus the murder of Gary Crouch and the attempted murder of Junior. He received six consecutive life sentences. And then these guys all ended up dying in prison which well-deserved because they seem like assholes. Uh, Agreed. So we have our second theory of why the road is so scary. And that's because the ghosts of Jimmy, Dwayne, and Wayne are haunting it. Which also like this one rooted in fact, but also so sad because that was Jimmy's father. His own dad killed him because he didn't want to go to prison. And then he ended up in prison anyway. Right. Literally no reason to murder these kids. The third theory on why this road is just so damn weird is that it's actually not this road and that people are confusing two different places. And some suggest that the symbols and vibe are being conflated from a place in Bucks County, Pennsylvania to a mystery home off of Coast Art Road. So they're like, oh, maybe they're just like confusing the places and they're like, "Hmm, this is weird. Now the location in Bucks County is just a touch over an hour and a half away, but compared to its soundings, it is relatively architecturally bizarre. And I'm like, that's kind of a far distance. But if you're thinking like rural-ish Pennsylvania areas, if you don't know Pennsylvania and you're like a weird place, maybe you could visit both and be confused. I don't know. We'll see. (laughs) But what is this Bucks County location? Well, it's the Rosicrucian Pyramids. Obviously. (laughs) obviously everything goes back to pyramid yeah of course it does of course it does before we get into the pyramids though we're going to do the briefest recap of what a rosicrucian is and we've actually talked about them before in our georgia guidestones episode which was forever ago christian rosenkreutz is said to be the founder of the secret rosicrucian society in germany in the early 15th century And others think that he didn't even live at all, so who could know? To the members of the society, Rosenkreutz was a doctor who spent a lifetime gathering, quote, sacred knowledge. The society was formed in order to pass on the learning so that it did not die with him. At first, all the members were doctors. And there was an oath to heal the sick without payment, to maintain the secrecy of the fellowship, and to find a replacement for Rosenkreutz before he passed away. Now, let's talk about the secret knowledge. It included elements of alchemy and psychic manipulation. Modern Rosicrucians are believed to have the ability to tap the ultimate power of the human mind. Hmm. Interesting skill to have. Yep, yep, yep. Some people believe that the group has evolved and they now seek to protect and guide humanity away from its own destruction. But not everyone thinks this. (laughs) And, you know, others accuse them of being evil. Offshoots of the group are everywhere. And their main symbol is a cross with a white rose in the middle. And it's called a rosy cross. So there is a site that has a lot of theories about the Rosicrucians. And from the first time we talked about this site, we have talked about it almost every episode since. (laughs) Many, not all, but many. (laughs) That is Vans Hardware. And the author of Vans Hardware is Van Smith. And it's a online journal of sorts. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Lindsay almost had us get a tattoo based off of this journal. So that that says how... Uh, yeah, we decided to not, just in case he's like problematic in a way, because we haven't read everything that's on there and the time doesn't exist to do that. And we we're like, what if he has like really problematic beliefs? We don't want to have like a tattoo about a guy who ends up being like super fucking bad. Exactly, exactly. But I mean, the weird square that he saw, the elusive square... <laughs> we think of often that we saw in fell's point oh yeah it was a purse we did (laughs) we did see that in fell's point i don't think that that could tumble around though if it had feet it could 
Maybe. Maybe. Anyways, back to Vans Hardware. Always back to Vans Hardware. Always. Forever. He believed that the Rosencrucians practiced something called assumption, which is the psychic ability to take over the minds of other people and also astral projection. It's a lot of things. So many things. We've talked about astral projection in the past, but it's the ability to project your soul outward to distant areas. And they can move things with their minds, which is psychokinesis. Van Smith also said that he would dedicate his life to, quote, uncovering these bastards <laughs> if he had the ability to do so. He feels very strongly about them. He's very dedicated. Yes. Yes. So, okay. Rosicrucians. Let's talk about this pyramid. It's a little baby pyramid. Yeah, it's a little baby pyramid. There's a video that we watched to like walk around this site that we'll include in the show notes so you can see what we're looking at. It looks kind, doesn't it? It has like a nice vibe. It's weird. I love that it's just like covered in like trees and growth yes. all around it. And then there's a fucking pyramid like in the middle of the forest, it looks like. Yeah, but there's also like a fountain pyramid. Yeah, and like to the side of it, it looks like. And then there's uh, maybe a house or something. There's some structures too, yeah. But like... When you look at it a certain direction, it looks like it's just this weird pyramid in a forest. Yes. I wish I had a pyramid in my backyard. Who doesn't? I never get anything cool. I mean, you could. That'll be a selling point for this house. Complete with weird rock pyramid. That's what we're doing when you're here next month. Ghost tour and pyramid building. No, once you move here, we can build a pyramid in, in your backyard. And in yours. It can be her enclosure, your turtle's enclosure. <laughs> she can't be outside if we move there. She'll die. Sometimes she can be in the summer. Maybe. So just to kind of like lay this out, watch the video when you're on the episode so you can get another vibe and see it. But there's a couple of not so strange buildings that are kind of in the front of this garden-esque place. And they're on the road. Tucked behind these structures, there's like a, again, it's kind of like a garden scape, if you will. There are three pyramids, one of which is a fountain. Another is 25 to 30 feet tall. And one of them you could actually walk inside and there's these kind of like glassless window things that you can like look into but you can't get into that next section but there's like symbols all over the walls and there's also symbols everywhere there's also a headless angel statue and their wings are unfurled i want one of those too who doesn't who doesn't there's a reflection pond with flowers in it and it's included on tons of tourist websites including visitbuckscounty.com and i would say like i don't see a sinister vibe to this where you would be like, hmm, this belongs in the same lore as an evil road, you know? All I'm having in my head right now is the song Reflection, the Disney song from Mulan. Oh, love it. I love it. So I don't think that people are confusing anything on Kozar Road for this, or but it is a theory out there. I also simply must do any throwback that truly does involve Vans Hardware. It's part of who I am. Oh, yeah. Everything goes back to Vance Hardware. Yeah. It always does. It does. <laughs> okay. So, Amanda. Yes. We have our evil road, our devil road, uh -huh. Cosart yep, Road. Yep, yep. Do you think it is the DuPont's mystery home that exists somewhere off of the road that we haven't been able to find, the ghosts of James, Dwayne, and Wayne, or that people are mixing it up for the Rosicrucian garden situation, or D, none of the above? I say D, none of the above, because I don't see ghosts making creepy, weird trees anywhere else. I feel like if that was a thing, that would be a thing to look for in haunted locations, right? Yes. I'm not going in order, obviously. The DuPonts, we know that that family exists in a sense, but we don't know if all of these allegations are true, right? Mm -hmm. And if they did have a house, like we talked about, their house wasn't exactly in this immediate area. Yeah, yeah. So, mm, I, I don't think that either. And then the Rosicrucian garden thing, like, it doesn't look ominous. Like, it doesn't look spooky or weird. It looks fairly innocent. It looks pleasant, even. Yeah, it does look pleasant. So, I'm not sure. Like, it looks creepy weird, right? Like, when you look at pictures of it, obviously, they make a movie in that area because it looks creepy weird. But I think that that might be it, is that it's a location that looks creepy and weird, that weird things tend to happen, but I don't see it as being evil. What about you? What do you think? Okay, so it's a couple things for me. We talked about that in the late 1970s was when James, Dwayne, and Wayne were murdered and their bodies were buried off of Cosart Road. I think that you, well, first off, Dean, none of the above, by the way, none of those things. Okay. I think that their murders happened right as the satanic panic was really taking off. And those rumors of an evil 
entity presence there being part of a time when people were kind of freaking out about satanic rituals, it was kind of like ripe for there to be a legend Mm -hmm. in that area. So I think that people were like, ooh, a spooky thing. Maybe this thing that we think is like super pervasive is also happening here. Maybe that's why this road is so evil. Not because a father murdered his son in those woods and other kids. You know what I mean? I say kids, but like they're 20 and under. So I'm like, they're kids. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. But I think it's that. I think it's just like a weird mixture of urban legends that kind of like made the situation. I don't think the road is evil. Look, I know that people keep saying that they didn't trim the trees for power lines, but it really looks like it to me. (laughs) It looks like really simple. Like I looked at the first picture and I was like, power lines, my man, power lines, and moved right on. But I was like, oh, I'm also, though, so intrigued by what people are thinking here because it's so, to me, just wild. And then drove us down like 16 different tangents. But it was interesting how much we learned in this episode. Like, again, didn't know a lot about the DuPont family, had never heard of the Johnston gang. Yeah. Didn't know anything about their first off being a little like Rosicrucian area in Pennsylvania at all. I certainly didn't know how sex offenders were being monitored with polygraphs. And I didn't know what like ailments were associated with inbreeding. I just kind of had like a vague stigma in my head, right? So I'm like, I loved researching this episode because there was just so much to learn. And I love to learn and to share it. Well, and it was a fun mixture of rabbit holes. Yeah. So we're like, oh, we can go down this one. And then it is all related in a very strange way, but they're all related. Yes. Well, that was a fun dive into a strange location. Yes. Yes. If you want to go to another very, very strange location with us, we do have our ghost tour coming up in Arizona this time, and that'll be on March 19th. There are a limited number of tickets. So if you do want to go, it'll be in Wickenburg, Arizona. Our show notes, our social media, everything has the link if you do want to purchase tickets and find some ghosties with us. Yeah. As always, we want to know your theories on this as well. We do. We do. We always do. Is it A, B, C, or D? Yeah, maybe you have an E. Maybe there's an E. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm-hmm. And with that, have a great weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. And as always, a special thank you to our patrons who support us via Patreon. Please see the link in our show notes to learn more about how you, yes, you, can begin to haunt the dump, guard vortexes, or even become a scorching Sasquatch. Also in our show notes, you can find the link to our website, more information on our sources, our social media handles, and our merch store. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps and or ghosts. I beg of you. (laughs) One of them (laughs) goes to work and has children. And got a new oh, dog that's dog? very cute. Yes, the new dog that you met. He was very cute. I got to pet him twice because I went outside to get something from the car and he was outside. He's a goodest boy. Love him. He, um, he is the goodest they boy. just like exist and are like no nonsense, no fuss neighbors. Sometimes their little dog, like they have a tiny dog as well, will go through the bars of my fence and like very sneakily pee in my yard and then run back. <laughs> but sometimes there's also, there's like my like, aluminum but it looks like red iron fence and right before it ends before it hits another part of fence there's like a wooden section so there's not my fence isn't there it's just that wooden fence but in a almost like cartoon like way the dog will go underneath that wooden part of the fence like it'll scoot its little body through and then it'll pee in the yard and then it'll go back from whence it's came it's hilarious i don't care and moo's like what are you doing <laughs> what is this Who's like cat doing? okay weird flex but get it moxie because that's her name and she's little little she was cute oh yeah like she's like tiny tiny yeah that's why i said cat yeah yeah and then my other neighbors are just like fixing cars perpetually i don't know what's going on with them you probably don't want to i don't know i don't know what's wrong with them but like not in a intrusive way it's just there's always some type of repair going on and drying laundry outside sometimes which isn't abnormal and having a garden and trees nothing weird there's nothing weird happening in my neighborhood except that one time when amanda was here and there was some guy who walked down my parents driveway (laughs) anyway as they do the fact that like you can say that with a straight face is so fucking difficult because i'm not trying to make fun of them it's just like they are a fucking rude species of animal you know i love geese that's terrifying i actually kind of off topic but just 
talking about geese. I have a cousin that is terrified of geese. And so something all of us do as a family is send her weird pictures of geese. Well, first off, I'm pro roasting any family member in a, in a funny and kind way. But secondly, you know that geese are really fucking rude, right? And will attack you. Yeah, they, they have their babies outside our house. So we're, we're always with the geese. I feed them. We're friends. That is very rare. Typically, geese are very mean and will like break you. They always fight with each other. And then I yell at them until they stop. And then they come and eat. We need order when they're eating. I don't allow for fights. Are you telling me that you are Mother Goose? <laughs> <laughs> oh, when I thought of it, I like sat up straight and put my little hands like I like crossed my hands in front of me and I was like, I'll wait till she's done. I won't interrupt her. I will wait. And then I had to. Amanda is Mother Goose. We've had a few of those moments today. Yes. No, earlier you were talking about something intense and I was like, I have to wait, I have to wait, I have to wait. But I found that you could buy Basilosaurus fucking fossils online and I I couldn't. How do you how do you hold that in? You know? It was the most difficult thing I've done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know where this is gonna go. It's gonna go somewhere in this episode though. This is gonna this has to go at the end. There's no other place to put it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He's the great grandson of EI. He's the great oh my gosh. Jesus fucking Christ, Lindsay. Is it going to be like a 7,000 things at the end of us going, like just un fucking unable to pronounce French names? Yep. I feel like French names are harder than anything. Russian names, which when we did Y'all of Pass, we had like. Oh, we, we had like I, we have a whole separate document on how to like pronounce everybody's names because we didn't want to say anybody's name wrong anyway anyway uh, ollie just lost another tooth and he ate it again god damn it ollie stop eating your teeth this is going to be a rich after show it definitely is yeah four out of four have been eaten four out of four he has a hearty gi system <laughs> right he has to <laughs> gibraltar gibraltar am i saying it wrong <laughs> I don't know. There's an L. Say it, say it, say it. No, look at me. Gibraltar. Look at me. One gang member. Member. His girlfriend, Robert. Or blah, blah, blah. 